afternoon, everyone. My name is Deborah Kern, and I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental Law Clinic at the University of Victoria. And it's my pleasure to work with the BC Mining Law Reform Network and to be a co-sponsor of this webinar. Um, we'd like to start out with uh, a welcome by Chief Francis Lassis. So I will turn it over to Chief Francis who is a chief of the Chilcotin Nation and has dedicated a majority of his lifetime to serving his community through leadership roles, uh, including as band manager and on council as well as chief. Chief Lassis has been chief since 1998 of the Tusi First Nation, and he is a strong advocate locally and internationally on issues relating to rights and titles, food security, the environment, and international human rights of indigenous people. So I'd like to turn it over to Chief Lassie. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I'm honored to be uh, to be part uh, to be uh, on the panel and uh, talking about water. And uh, so uh, I'm one of the six uh, Chilcotin chiefs, uh, part of the Chilcotin Nation. And uh, so I'm honored uh, to be here. Thank you very much. All right, so today's uh, panel of very well experienced individuals are going to be speaking on mine wastewater pollution and indigenous laws. And, you know, this issue is very timely. Often issues arise from mines because of waste and water issues and their associated risks. And provinces often give mining companies permits to discharge wastewater into lakes and rivers despite concerns from indigenous communities on whose territories those waters are and local communities. So increasingly indigenous nations are making their own laws visible to the colonial legal apparatus and making clear expectations about uh, to proponents and to provincial and territorial governments about adhering to those laws. So in this webinar, we'll learn about the Chilcotin National Government's concerns and appeal of the Gibraltar mine wastewater um, into the Fraser River, and also hear about the Nedley Wootens water law and how this is being implemented at the Nzaco mine to improve mine water treatment. I'd like to thank the co-sponsors of this webinar, so the BC Mining Law Reform Network, the Chilcotin National Government, and also the Environmental Law Center at UVic. If you would please put your questions into the Q&A function, and we have a number of individuals who are uh, coordinating the Q&A who will be picking and choosing those and sending them to me to ask them to the panelists when we get to the end of the presentations. And we have over 200 people signed up to be on this webinar today, which is a fantastic turnout from across Canada and elsewhere. So do feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. So we're first going to start um, by talking about and hearing about the Esbe Law Water Law. Um, so I'd like to first introduce uh, Councillor Howard Johnny, who will speak, and then we'll also then go to JP LaPlante, who works as the Chilcotin National Government Senior Advisor um, on Lands and Waters. So Councillor Howard Johnny has been uh, on council for the Esquilaw First Nation for 17 years, and his focus has been on the protection of lands, culture, and ways of life uh, for the people of Esquilaw. Councillor Johnny. In the introduction there, and um, I'm speaking on the our water law here and the protection of our rivers and all tributaries that go into the Fraser River. Okay, the people of a stale off First Nation, and that translates into the word uh, land meets the water of the Chilcot Nation. We live in the region on both sides of the Fraser River between Quinella and Williams Lake. And Chilcotin means the river people. And our law was put in place to protect most of everything that's been dumped into the Fraser River to protect the waters because I'm all First Nations. Most of the people are dependent on all the fishing and everything in the river and all that it provides. 
and water carries our babies in the womb and is sacred and is a direct connection to our land, which can use give us a life after we are born. So it's critical we protect all the water within our territory for our children, grandchildren, generations to become. And it's this the Chilcotin culture and livelihood, everything that we wanna protect the water. So it is, could be used later on down in the future generations. And our waters are now being threatened by tailings and affluent discharge going directly into the freezer by a mining company. And there is no sufficient water treatment to protect all the water being discharged. And that's something we would like to see is are all our waters protected more and not just being used, used like that. And we have water ceremonies along the, for the freezer to protect our waters and now we finally put all this uh, law down on paper in, into writing in the, when we did a signing in May of uh, 2020. Our teachings govern our daily obligations including taking only what you need to keep the water clean, not degrading and trying to restore the health of the water when it is harmed. We always rely on Fraser to drink, fish, swim, and carry out our sacred ceremonies. We use it to travel and exercise our rights in our territories. And the uh, Sturgeon River Law confirms Chilcom government stewardship and management responsibilities over the water that flow out throughout the whole of its caretaker area. This law comes from the Chilcone inherited teachings handed down through generations. And here's the thing that any proposed activities in our territory and that will impact it, that Sturgeon River have been a consent. Our people have always relied on water from the Fraser to meet our basic needs and for culture and spiritual purposes. We recognize the importance of protecting and preserving the Fraser from degradation, including discharge of fluent or dilution of discharge. We have witnessed the destruction impact of responsible government and industry, and we are ex exercising our rights to ensure that the destruction of our lands and water does not continue. And those who wish to pursue projects in the must ensure they seek consent from our chief and council and ensure they are following the law. And this was a signing we did on the, in 2020 of May by our leaders at that time. So thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Johnny. I'd like to introduce JP LaPlante. Um, who is the Chilcotin National Government Senior Advisor for Chilcotin NEN, so Water, Lands, and Resources. Prior to this role, he was the nation's mining, oil, and gas manager and responsible for reviews and engagement related to the Gibraltar mine. JP has experience in land and resource planning, negotiations, and policy development, environmental assessment for major projects, human health and ecological risk assessment, and monitoring and reclamation planning for abandoned mines. JP. Thanks, Steph. Much appreciated. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is JP LaPlante and uh, appreciate the warm introduction. Um, thank you, Chief Francis and Howard, uh, as well as to the organizers for this opportunity. Um, I'm hoping, please let me know if you can't hear me well. Um, and yeah, I work for the Sokotin National Government and that's the nation level government that works for the six Sokotin communities, including SD Law, um, as well as Cles Co or 2C. Um, and it's a deep honor to be here. Uh, I'm joining you today from unceded Sequapamulu uh, in Williams Lake. And uh, I'm going to provide, I'm going to share a presentation with you. Um, oh, sorry. Let me just 
pull it up here. And please let me know if this doesn't work. Is that looking okay? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, thank you. So um, I think the, a little bit, just as an overview of what I'd like to share with you today, um, I think uh, I will speak to the kind of core issues, which is um, in effect about a conflict between laws and values and ways of being um, related to the discharge into the Fraser River and the Tsilkotin. Um, I'll also speak about um, the, just a little bit of background about the Gibraltar mine and the discharge. Um, and just why the community is so, communities are so concerned. Um, and it is primarily about, and you know, the discharge of almost untreated tailings effluent from the Gibraltar mines tailings pond directly into the Fraser River, about four kilometers downstream of Howard's community of Estee Law and upstream of Chief Francis's community. Um, I, We'll also speak to the appeal that um, is currently underway that um, the Silco Team National Government filed in 2019 and uh, where the final, the kind of the closing hearings are coming up actually next week. Um, and then I'll speak a little more broadly both to just why this is important and relationships with water and then also um, what you might consider doing. Um, I think taking a step back, I, I'd like to um, just introduce, um, this goes to partly why, and it's around Estee laws and the Tsoko teens' rights and responsibilities. Um, the nation and the communities um, have a responsibility, and I'm, I'm gonna quote, I'm actually gonna quote the Sturgeon River Law. Um, they have a responsibility to ensure that two which is the Tsoko Teen for water, um, is safe and clean for current and future generations, um, and that they exercise this responsibility as part of their right to govern and steward the use and the management of two in their territory. Um, I think it's really important to understand that um, it isn't just a right, it's, it is a responsibility, and it's a responsibility that as I understand it, each and every Tsoko teen person carries. Um, and it's what they're taught from being a very young person. And it, it forms from what seem like simple, but really also profound um, teachings around taking only what you need and also ensuring that you're keeping the water clean and not putting anything in it that could degrade it. Um, I, you know, this Tsoko teen nation remains very strong um, in their sovereignty that's been handed down from their ancestors. Um, and this, this photo on this slide is actually when the prime minister exonerated the Tsukotin war chiefs of 1864 who sacrificed their lives for their people and their way of life. Um, this exoneration took place a few years ago um, in the declared tidal area out in Namaya. And um, you know, the, what the war chiefs did was um, stand up their laws, and it's what the, the Tsoko Teen Nation continues to do through various efforts. And those include um, the Supreme Court, um, the title case that went all the way to the Supreme Court and resulted in Canada's first declaration of uh, Aboriginal title. Um, and also through the work around things like the Sturgeon River Law, which was a, uh, a water law that was passed by SD law with the support of the Tsoko Teen Nation um, approximately one year ago. And uh, it is through these laws and values and principles that the nation um, continues to exercise their authority and jurisdiction. Um, I, I think it's also really important to reflect that um, the Tsoko Teen people have always relied on the Elder Co um, to drink, fish, swim, carry out ceremonies, travel, and generally exercise their rights. Um, and 
these law these rights as well as their laws around the protection of water are being violated because um, in part of the colonial history that we have here in British Columbia. Um, and then, and through that, the laws which permit um, violations of the Tsokotin's rights to use, manage, and benefit from their nen, that's their land, as well as their two or water. Um, and I, this is important because I think what we're witnessing today is the results of that, um, those violations which have led to mismanagement. And so we're, we're no longer managing for abundance. We're now managing um, for scarcity. And so we've seen major declines in sturgeon, in salmon, in other species, the like four-legged species in Sokotin territory. And it's, you know, the result is that we're really, we're really faced with um, stark choices about protection. That makes this work all that more important. Um, I also want to move on and, and give a bit of a background just about the Gibraltar mine and SD law. Um, this is Canada's second largest open pit copper mine. It produces copper and molybdenum concentrates, which are then shipped to Asia. Um, you can see here on the map in the upper right, you'll see the approximate location in British Columbia. Um, and the map in the bottom right gives you a, like a schematic of the mine site itself and where the tailings pond is. And the Google Earth image um, perhaps gives a better view, overview of, of you know, what the mine looks like. Um, the scale is huge, um, so these images don't do that justice. Um, these are mountains of, of waste rock. Um, it's also really important to note that this mine operates um, immediately adjacent to Estee Law. So um, you can see on the Google Earth image that IR12 is, IR is Indian Reserve 12. Um, that's Estee Law's reserve. It's, you could almost throw a rock from the mine site over onto their land. Um, that land has been largely alienated from them because of its proximity to the mine. Um, and a little bit further over, but still not far away, are the main communities um, which straddle the Fraser River. And this is located about halfway between Williams Lake, British Columbia, and Quesnel, British Columbia. Um, the other, the issue that we're here to talk about today is, is actually represented by that red line on the map. Um, and that is a pipe that's laid into the ground um, that runs from the mine and sends um, tailings effluent from the mine to the Fraser River and then is, is discharged through um, basically these nozzles that are buried at the bottom of the river. Um, that's about four kilometers downstream and I'll speak in more detail about just what that looks like in a little bit. Um, the mine um, is, has about three billion pounds of copper remaining um, and 53 million pounds of molybdenum. Um, that equates to what for the company would be 18 years of open pit mining remaining. It was built in 1972 um, and in part um, during an era when there was like, absolutely no environmental assessment um, and zero, in effect, zero consultation um, and nowhere close to consent um, with, the, with SD law. So, um, you know, we're dealing, I think, with the, the legacy of that and we're, we're, you know, we're trying to make the best out of what's not a, a good situation. Um, I think the other important thing to know is that it, it has closed before. It was closed in 1998 due to low metal prices. It was purchased, uh, or sorry, in the mid-1990s um, and it was purchased in 1998 by Tosico Mines Limited and reopened in 2004 and it's 75% owned by Tosico Mines Limited, which is based in Vancouver. Um, the, in 2013, it underwent a major mine expansion that doubled how quickly it, it could mine the ore. And uh, so about 85,000 tons a day goes through its mills. Um, I think another thing to flag is that despite that expansion, 
Um, you know, there's still a lot of like legacy issues that have still never been dealt with. Um, and a real concern about the reclamation bond as well, that it's very underfunded, this mine site. Um, and it, to the, an order of magnitude underfunded. Um, and yeah, so I think that's a little bit about the mine. I want to share with you a little bit more about the discharge now. And I think when the mine, when the mine opened, reopened in 2004, they had a problem and that was too much water on the mine site. And so um, what had taken place is since the 1980s, the mine had been uh, prohibited from letting water run every which way off the mine site. And so that's been collecting water that falls on the mine site. It's called contact water um, since the 1980s and has been generating a surplus of water that's needed to be stored since then. Um, for a number of years, that was managed by just putting the water in the old open pits and otherwise, and in the tailings pond. Um, but by the time the mine reopened in the early 2000s, um, it, was, it is filling up, it is full and requires dealing with how to manage where the water goes. Um, the company in 2000, approximately 2004, 2005 proposed to send that water from the tailings pond to the Fraser River through a pipe that ironically was already in the ground. That pipe was actually there from when the mine was originally built to supply water for the milling of the ores. Um, and at that time, um, but you know, over time through recycling water, they had, um, you know, they'd stopped using it. And, uh, but now it was being proposed to actually reverse the water and send it to the Fraser River. Um, they received a permit from the province of BC um, in 2005. Um, that was for sending 190 liters per second or approximately 16 million liters of tailings effluent per day between, um, to the Fraser River. Um, Estee Law's neighbor to the south, Hatsuul First Nation appealed that. That actually went to the Environmental Appeal Board and, uh, and was overturned um, and sent back for further review. In 2009, that permit was reissued with different conditions, but in effect, the practice continues. Um, and one of the changes that was made um, by, as a result of that appeal was that the company is only allowed to send the effluent to the river from April till November of each year. And that's because of concern that when the Fraser River is not flowing really strongly, that the, um, the effluent doesn't dilute quick enough in the river. And I'm gonna stop there because you might wonder what that means in terms of dilution and dilution capacity. And uh, as with the title of this, this webinar, um, it really is um, a, a practice, a management practice that is in place here in BC that allows effluent to go into water bodies that does not meet BC's water quality guidelines. Instead, it uses the river itself to dilute what's put in the water in order to meet those guidelines a certain distance downstream. And that's the case here um, with the Gibraltar mine. Um, you might also be wondering what we mean by tailings effluent. And um, just to explain, um, it is the, the the water and it is not clean water. Um, it is the water that has gone through the milling process at the mine site and generally been collected from the mine and ends up in the tailings pond. Um, it's in effect allowed to settle in the tailings pond. And then from there it's sent via the pipe down to the Fraser River. Um, the tailings pond water and what's in the pipe has a variety of metals and elements that are above BC's water quality guidelines, in particular copper, um, sulfate, nitrates, and other metals. So there's a number of um, things in the water which otherwise would not meet the water quality guidelines. Um, and it's in effect using the Fraser River to dilute, dilute those things so that, you know, downstream it can meet, the, the river itself meets the water quality guidelines. 
Um, I think this is the crux of the issue, um, is that the Fraser River is effectively being used as a sewer. Um, and Estilo and the Tsokotin have um, always been opposed to this. Um, and despite, despite having lots of concerns about the water accumulating, and that's its own issue and needs to be dealt with, um, but using the river to meet the water quality guidelines is of real concern. Um, I will also want to speak to just about the Tsokotin response and not just to the discharge, but more generally um, and wanting to, you know, what is in effect standing up their laws. Um, and, but at first I'm going to start just to speak to why they're opposed to this discharge. So I, th I think that an obvious one and a primary one is that it, it is in violation of their laws related to caring for water um, and the world in general. And, uh, and they've been, the community of SD law has been calling for sophisticated water treatment before discharge um, so that the water at least meets or is better than the Fraser River before leaving the pipe. Um, there's also a need for more holistic water management at the mine that's informed and guided by the community's values. Um, and I, as an example, um, the water collection has actually resulted in the community's IR12 having its water cut off, um, which is a real issue. And so there's been all these um, kind of uh, side effects from the mine. And I'm just speaking of water that doesn't get into animals and dust and other impacts. Um, and just generally not being able to access that area. But there are all these side effects that um, need to be approached in a holistic manner and is not taking place right now. Um, the other key thing to know is that the communities, as I mentioned before, are really seeing you know, major and alarming declines in, in the traditional foods that support them. And that's a, it's a real issue that um, needs to be addressed and, and the work that the community and the nation is doing is really um, is seeking to um, respond to what is a crisis. And lastly, I want to acknowledge that Chief Francis's community is downstream. Um, they have uh, reserves on the Fraser River as well, as, as do many other First Nations and non-First Nation communities. So this is really about protecting the watershed um, by doing their part in their own backyard. And so there's uh, this relationship to the rest of the province. And even those um, from faraway places that perhaps rely on Fraser River salmon um, for their culture. So there's these connections throughout um, and it just makes this bigger than just a Silco team concern. I think the, um, I mentioned that there was um, an appeal underway. The company in 2015 um, applied for a one year, a one year permit to increase how much they send to the river. So they um, originally were sending about 16 million liters of tailings effluent per day. They proposed to send 24 million um, and that was approved in 2015 for one year over the objections of the Tsilkotin nation and the community. And the rationale behind it was that despite sending all this effluent to the river, they're still accumulating too much water at the mine site. So they're not in balance up there and that's an issue. And so as they continue to collect water, that is a risk that they're managing by doing something that the community is opposed to in, its, in the current form. Um, in 2018, the company applied for um, first a permanent application to make that increased level of discharge permanent, and then later adjusted it to be a three-year application. In 2019, they received that permit, again, over the Tsilkotin Nation, Nation's objections. And um, the Tsilkotin National Government in about, I think it was the end of April of 2019, appealed that permit. I think uh, we're currently in that appeal now um, we've been in hearings um, starting in March, and the final closing hearing takes place May 20th and 21st. If anyone is interested in observing those proceedings, they are actually being live streamed by
by the Environmental Appeal Board of British Columbia. So that can be observed on May, May 20th and 21st. Um, and the appeal is centered on two key issues. Um, the first, the main grounds are that the Ministry of Environment in issuing the amendment to the permit to allow for the increase in discharge, first protect, uh, failed to protect the environment um, by failing to ensure that the effluent does not, first does not exceed the permit conditions and two, failing to consider and evaluate adverse impacts on white sturgeon in this stretch of the river. And number two, that they failed to adequately consult the Tsoko Team Nation on the scope and content of the principle of non-degradation under Tsoko Team Indigenous law. So in effect, the water laws of the nation. Um, and this led to a failure to properly accommodate the nation for the impacts on Tsoko Team rights. So that's what's before the Environmental Appeal Board. And lastly, I, I do want to also reflect on um, the slide that I've shared. This is a news clipping from 2020. And um, I think uh, it was a proud day when Estee Law, with the support of the nation, um, put into writing what is in effect uh, a law that's never it's not new, it's just been shared in a different way than has ever been done before and, and shared with the world um, in an effort to improve the understanding of Soko team laws and jurisdiction. And I think uh, Councillor Howard is, is very humble in how he describes the work. Uh, it's, it's a really, um, it was really proud and, and an important day and um, good on Howard and his community for for taking these steps to standing up their laws. I'm gonna kind of, you know, approaching some wrap up here. I think the, there are some underlying kind of issues that I wanna speak to. And a lot of them relate to relationships with water. Um, and first is what is a lack of understanding and respect for water that leads to the acceptance of the current practice of discharging the effluent into the river. And then also a lack of understanding and respect for Tsoko team laws and their relationships to water and their territory, including the Fraser River, which is, you know, in effect, a cultural lifeline along with the, um, the Tsoko or Chokotan River. Um, these can't be understated. I think they're, they're really crucial. And in a lot of ways, they're not actually that complicated. You know, I think what the community is asking for is if the mine can afford to make lots of profits for its shareholders, then surely it can afford to clean up after itself um, and not be continuing this practice. Um, you know, we recognize that this is a worldwide problem and, and isn't just here, um, but this is um, the responsibility of the communities in the nation and is a place where we can act and make change now. Um, and we're hoping, you know, with the help of all of you. Um, I think the other aspect here is that this is also um, a lack of respect for future generations. And Howard spoke to that. Um, the Sturgeon River Law, which was passed last year, also speaks to this relationship to future generations. And I, I really encourage anyone interested in this kind of work to, um, to look up um, that law and and it's worth it's, it's worth reading um, and yeah with that uh, I want to say thank you Sachin Alia to everyone for this opportunity to share um, thanks to um, Deb and the Environmental Law Clinic at the University of Victoria um, thanks to TNG staff behind the scenes and the BC Mining Law Reform Network um, and to everybody for taking time out of your day. Um, I also want to leave with two suggestions if you're wondering like what you might consider doing. Um, first, please consider supporting Estee Law and TNG in their efforts, um, both kind of moral, public and financial support. Um, if you're thinking of financial support, if you go to the web link that's on this page, socoteen.ca uh, forward slash Gibraltar, there is a PayPal link and that funding could um, go to supporting the appeal. Um, and then in other ways, 
please consider writing or speaking with your MLA and ministers, um, Minister of Environment, Minister of Mines. Um, please be polite, but make it clear that what's happening um, is unacceptable. And um, the second part of what you might consider doing is just seeing how this is connected to a broader failure to see and respect Indigenous peoples um, on whose land we live. And uh, it isn't just about platitudes or introductions. It's about, you know, actually practicing respect for their laws and values. Um, and this is a chance for the rubber to hit the road. And that's it for me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, JP, for that very comprehensive overview, uh, very clear explanation of the issues and, um, and the, the interests and the position of the Chilcotin National Government and the, the affected communities. I'd like to now go to um, the, the example of the Nadli Wooten who have enacted their or made visible their water <laughs> law in a number of policies and documents their surface water management policy a few years ago and have them explain how it is affecting uh, the practice of mining in British Columbia. So let me first introduce the two presenters from Natalie Wooten. So Chief Larry Newski was first elected to council in 1992 and has served Natalie Wooten in various capacities since, including as band manager, a counselor, pipeline coordinator, and chief. Located on the shores of the Nadli Bunket or Fraser Lake in the Nechako Plateau, Chief Newski's homeland encompasses approximately 500,000 hectares of pristine lands, abundant water, and various natural resources. Joining uh, Chief Newski is Dr. Rena Freed, who is a senior environmental engineer and partner at Source Environmental Associates. Dr. Freed has 17 years experience working at mines across Canada and <coughs> mine design permitting and mine closure. Her expertise includes mine waste management planning, water balance and water quality and groundwater modeling. Dr. Freed has experience with engaging communities in alternatives for mine design and government to government co-management with First Nations territories. So just before I turn it over to the team from Natalie Wooten, please uh, do put your comments for JP and just generally in the Q&A function and we'll have lots of time uh, after this presentation for uh, addressing questions. So I'll turn it over to Chief Nisky and Dr. Freed. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> name is Larry Nisky and I'm coming from uh, the Seychelles territory where my wife's from. Um, uh, I, I'd like to thank everybody for joining today. So. Uh, the development and implementation implementation of the Yankee uh, surface water laws. Go ahead. <clears throat> the water declaration of the Yankee is at me. We, the first people of this land, therefore declares that our rights, in, including our title and our legal responsibilities, were not given to us by our were given to us by our ancestors and cannot be altered or taken away by other nations. We will forever for, uh, maintain our freedoms and self-determination, our language and our spirit, spiritual belief and our culture. We will therefore, we will forever fulfill and maintain our rights and obligations and the protection of the water and everything that water touches and gives life to, including uh, the lands, animals, uh, air, plants, and humankind. We forbid any f future de development in our tradition territory without our consent. We will wish to work with our water, excuse me, whoever wishes to work with our water will abide by our traditional governance uh, system called Batlats and we will work, we will require outside users to respect our laws and our rights to the use of our waters. We're not in principle, Opposed, in principle, opposed to the economic development um, to our territory, 
but we all, but all such development must be done in a way that protects the rights and obligation of uh, the water, not lay and slat, and to protect our, our sacred too. Not lay and slat, and must also fully benefit from all economic development in our territory. We will strive to develop and the best way to fulfill the full management and the protection of the obligation of the rights of not of Notley and Sela. And we will require all outside users of water in our territory to respect our laws in this regard. It is in this spirit that we have enacted the Yankadene Azatne uh, Surface Water Management Policy and the Yankadene Azatne Guide to Surface Water Standards. Go ahead. The Yankadene territories, our traditional lifestyles are reliant on unfettered access to water and use of the natural resources. Our relationship to water and natural resources differ from the, the, uh, those of most non-Indigenous uh, Canadian. For example, in our territory, uh, when we use our, the, the salmon resources, we, we use uh, quite a bit more than the non-Native people. And part of that, uh, that use includes uh, salmon and the salmon is an important staple to our, our diet. So for us, it, it, we, we need to ensure that the, the, there's unfettered uh, use of uh, um, the lands. Excuse me, I'm, I'm having a hard time with my throat. <clears throat> When it comes to mining in our territories, solution is not the solution. We have approach uh, developed with our water, our water laws. We have success stories from implementing our water laws to pro to protect the Indaco mine and then propose black water mine. We. Up until recently, we've had uh, a lot of challenges within that mine. Here's the key factors that regarding the, the help that turned things around for the success of our water laws. The provincial political landscape, LNG proposal, and G2G landscape it was uh, one of the requirements that we had in terms of uh, turning around the the provincial uh, laws, pathways negotiations, corporate and cultural of the companies involved. These were the uh, few helping hands that 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 uh, provided us um, the ability to move forward with the with the um, water laws. Go ahead. The Water Declaration of the Yankadene Azatne. Yankadene Laws and Governance. The governments, the Kani uh, First Nations have governed their collective territories through their Yankadene laws for thousands of years. Members of the Notley with NF are affiliated with clans and with that include hereditary leaders as known as Azatne, who are responsible for the land and resource management and known as a Kaya, associated with uh, extended family. Go ahead. The transition for the new paradigm. Development of the water implementation of the Yankadene surface water laws. 
problem to um, address pollution at Indaco mine motivated us to formalize and um, publicize our water laws in 2016. Um, following our laws and how proponents and provincial ministry shows uh, res respect to our nation. Components of the water laws, the proposed the policy of the development of uh, fulfill our legal obligation as stewards and uh, to respond to the ongoing impacts to the water surface, water in our territory. You can see uh, here that we had both the Yankadene Zatne surface water management policy, including uh, Yankadene Zatne guide to surface water uh, quality standards, which were instrumental in helping us uh, develop uh, the water laws for our territory. Go ahead. You want me to start, Sam? Yes, please. Thank you, Chief Larry. Um, to explain the implementation of the Yinkadene water law and the water management policy, I'm going to use the Adaco mine as an example. There are a number of discharges from the mine uh, currently, four to the south and one to the north. The main discharge um, from the mine in the future will also be from the open pit to the north. So there's these mine discharges and they enter tributaries or small streams. And the northern discharges from the mine, they flow into the Indaco River. And the southern discharges flow towards Francois Lake. These bodies eventually flow into the Fraser River. The Indaco River and Francois Lake are habitat for critical species, including Chinook and sockeye salmon. And in 2015, BC Ministry of Environment acknowledged Nodley's concerns with impacts potentially from molybdenum, sulfate, and TDS in discharges from the mine. So Nautilus had success um, with the Indaco mine, and this is partly because of the Indaco Water Quality Working Group. This was set up with the BC Ministry of Environment in 2016. Uh, as the relationship with the Ministry of Environment stabilized and improved, communications opened up between all the parties. With tri-party discussions, including the company, we can efficiently address concerns and find consensus on expectation. So the Water Quality Working Group's recommendations to the decision makers have the full weight of the Ministry of Environment staff, the nations, and the proponent. This has resulted in setting clear expectations for medical minds, greater alignment with the Yikindene water policy, and shared decision making and stewardship over Nodley and Stilatin traditional territories. So the Water Quality Working Group, it's a win-win experience, and we built an authentic and positive working relationship together. I would like to give a shout out here to members of the Water Quality Working Group, including my teammates, Cheryl Baer, Mike LaPlante, Bev Cutlow, Alison Shine, Georgina Farah, as well as Gabby Matcha of Ministry of Environment and Randy McGillivray of Sentara. So under the Yinka Identity Water Law, the water management policy classifies water bodies into three classes. Class one waters are of high cultural or ecological significance. This means water quality conditions should not be degraded, substantially altered or impaired by human activities. Class two waters are sensitive waters for which the primary water management goal is to provide an enhanced level of protection for all life stages of sensitive species. Class three waters are typical waters for which the primary management goal is to protect the designated uses of surface water resources, such as aquatic life, wildlife, or drinking water. Now, Nodley and Stilatin have classified their water bodies. For waters near the Indaco mine, Francois Lake is classified as a class one water body. The Indaco River is a class two water body. And the tributaries near the mine site are class three water bodies, which means the typical level of protection under the BC Ministry of Environment. So a key step for the Water Quality Working Group was our development of narrative objectives for each water class. This was a big milestone we achieved by consensus. We considered short, medium, and long-term timeframes. For example, our short-term implementation timeframe starts soon in early 2022. Class one waters must have no measurable mine-related effect on water quality during all time periods. This is a non-degradation goal. 
In addition, the class one objective is for continuous improvement, meaning that mine pollution does not increase with time and efforts are made to reduce current discharges to Francois Lake. So for class two waters, the Indaco River in this case, in the short term, water quality guidelines must be met or there's no increase over background concentrations. And also drinking water uh, users in the area are protected, which is actually very important for the Indaco River. In the medium term, the class two objective is to protect all uses such as aquatic life, wildlife and irrigation or to have no increase over background concentrations. And in the long term, class two waters must meet the ultimate goal of enhanced protection not exceeding the average of the provincial water quality guidelines and background levels. For class three waters, the short and medium term objectives are to maintain ecological structure and function, as well as to protect traditional use. In the long term, the objective for class three waters is to protect all water uses, as indicated by either water quality guidelines or site specific protective concentration levels. These objectives represent significant improvement from the current water quality at the site. The timelines, 5, 10, and 15 years, provide a deadline for continuous improvement to be achieved. Here, I'm showing an example where the narrative objectives, the words, were translated into numeric targets or numbers, in this case, site-specific protective concentration levels for sulfate. Numeric targets are measurable benchmarks that Indaco mine must meet. Class 1 targets are low, as you can see here, and represent baseline values. For class two waters, the BC water quality guideline is the short term and medium term target, protection of aquatic life. For the long term, the target is lower to reflect enhanced protection. For class three waters, a sulfate target of about 1100 is currently protective of aquatic life. This was determined with site specific toxicity testing. For the long term target, um, 500 in this case, the lowest water quality guideline was used protection of drinking water. In general, the lower the targets uh, as we progress towards the long term means there'll be continuous improvement of water quality. We also develop site specific numeric targets for total dissolved solids and molybdenum. Now I'm going to shift to um, the mitigations. What does this mean on the ground? This graphic depicts a process of the continuous improvement framework, which is the structure we developed within the water quality working group. This process was developed by consensus and includes a best achievable technology or BAT assessment for each of the three time frames we've talked about. We are currently working on updating um, the Ministry of Environment permit to reflect the proposed changes that we're talking about. Um, the key message in this graphic is that continuous improvement is realized by setting firm deadlines to achieve more stringent targets as we progress through a process that spans over 15 years. The targets and the timelines are the two essential parts promoting the mitigation planning. The proposed mitigation planning was influenced by the Incadene water management policy. A southern option was initially proposed by the mine in the BAT study and is depicted in this graphic. The proposal was to combine all the discharges and bypass the tributaries with a direct discharge to Francois Lake, either using the existing channel or a pipeline. While the lake has a large potential for dilution, we concluded that this approach did not fit with the overall water management policy in terms of protection goals for class one water bodies. We also considered how the management actions could fit into the bigger picture of meeting the longer term goals. The outcome of our review recommended a different strategy involving sending discharges to the north to the Indaco River. This image depicts the option we proposed with discharges focused to the north. While our team preferred that discharges be directed to the open pit, if that was not possible, then we prefer discharges be directed to N1 and then north to Ndaco River. This approach minimized loadings to class one water bodies. A key rationale for this approach is that we'd like to consolidate contact water to the north towards a central collection point for water treatment in future. Also, the Ndaco mine is expected to need long-term discharge for acid rock drainage in future, a northern discharge from the pit. Our assessment was based on meeting the targets developed and maintaining the highest level of protection for Francois Lake. The Indaco mine revised their proposed plans in order to respect Nodling and Stilatin's preferred mitigation options. So achieving success with the Indaco mine is a long-term project. Nodling has a lot of patience and perseverance. And as a result, the Indaco mine is on track to meet protective targets. Without Nodling's dedication and resources, it is clear the mine would not be on track. We are happy with the success and the implementation of the water law. 
Our team has gratitude for the Water Quality Working Group members. The consensus approach takes time and it has worked. We're looking forward to implementation of the targets in the years ahead. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Dr. Freed and Chief Nooski. That's a fantastic other example and overview of the work that um, the water quality uh, management policy and the other documents that uh, Natalie Wooten has put forward, how it's having an impact actually in relationship to the state legal order or to the provincial government's um, regulation of the mine. So we're going to turn to questions. So please do put your questions in the Q&A function. And I know that um, I would direct the presenters there as well, in particular the, the staff or the technical staff, because I think there are a number of questions that can be answered that are, um, are fairly easily answered or more technical questions like what are the actual contaminants that are going into the Fraser River. So I would invite the presenters to answer those kinds of questions. And then I will direct some questions directly to the presenters that are a, a little bit more general or big picture. So the first one is, can um, either, either um, the, anyone from the Chukot National Government or from the, the um, Nadli Wooten, can you say whether your law, so whether the Yinka Dene law or the Ezdala law have formally been recognized, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> by the province of BC or by the federal government? And then can you comment on what are the penalties <clears throat> or the consequences that are built into the statement of those laws as they are expressed currently? Meaning the outward statement, because we appreciate that the way in which they operate within your own communities is or maybe quite different than the way in which they present in an outward way. I'm not sure if Chief Nooski or um, Councillor Johnny want to take that on. I, I'm trying to gather my thought. My wife just walked in. So um, our, our laws are, haven't been uh, formally uh, taken up by either the provincial or, or the uh, federal government, although we, we have been uh, pressuring the, uh, the Minister of, for, uh, for Minister of uh, mining to ensure that uh, the protection of the water is uh, is paramount uh, so we they, we do have some um, working relationship with the mining industry right now that that is um, that is uh, helping us right now um, maybe Rena can answer a little bit more on the um, the actual work that's happening right now at the Indaco mines? Sure, um, thank you, Chief Larry. Um, so yeah, there's the Indaco mine example and there's also the Blackwater mine, a pr proposed mine. And in both cases, there is formal recognition of um, the water law through, um, I guess, regulatory instruments such as um, environmental conditions from the federal and the provincial government and um, and through the permit and the permit, the documents associated with the Ministry of Environment permit. I, I hope that answers the question, but I'll stop there. Okay, um, JP, I guess you could answer that question for me there. Oh. Yeah, I could, I can speak to it and Chief Francis may want to jump in as well, following me. Um, I, yeah, I think there, there is not formal recognition. Interestingly, during the appeal, there's been, it's been a focus of our discussion, like our, the arguments being made in, at the Environmental Appeal Board. So that um, makes it interesting. Um, I think it is really critical that there is, um, there are mechanisms for, um, for, that recognition and there, you know, it's interesting 
um, that I've heard someone say, um, you know, someone from the Nuchalnath Nation, a chief say, they're finally seeing us and, um, but there's still a lot of work to do. So there, that work is incomplete. Um, that's not being formally recognized at this time. Um, we would like it to be, most certainly. There's a lot of, curi there is curiosity about it, but not necessarily a mandate to, um, to implement and, and formally recognize and respect. So that is something that um, I think all of this work collectively um, is hopefully building towards. Um, and it's about having a, I'm trying to think, I'm not a lawyer, but it's like a, you know, a plurality of laws um, on the landscape and being able to respect them. So um, there is a real need um, here for the province to understand and respect and get proponents in Sopotine territory to make sure there's mechanisms for that respect. Um, the other two things really quickly before, I, I think Chief Francis can speak to this better than me, but you know, the, the law does not have, <clears throat> the Sturgeon River law does not have identified penalties at this time. Um, it has a mechanism for creating schedules that allow for penalties to be established. Um, but, you know, what I've been told by um, Soko team leaders and members that are wiser than me is that it's, you know, traditionally the goal was not to have to de deal with it as a compliance issue, but as a teaching and sharing issue. And um, if there's respect up front, you don't, you know, it's hopefully it solves the problem before there's a problem. And, you know, we're dealing with a different context and that makes it very challenging, but um, the hope is that there would be respect for and compliance with the law um, without having to resort to things like penalties. Chief Francis, would you, would you like to add anything around that? I don't know if you caught the full, full question either. We could maybe ask Deb to repeat it if, uh, if that would help. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, earlier, I didn't know I, had to, I was supposed to say a bit more, but uh, I thought it was just an opening. But uh, yeah, um, basically what's happening uh, to us as a people, uh, as a nation, I guess um, what happened back in the day, there was a genocide. Genocide was um, implemented on us, you know, so we were reduced to a uh, a handful of people compared to what we used to used to be and the reasons back then was so we wouldn't be here to so they can do what they're doing today basically that's what it's all about you know so and that genocide is still continuing you know uh not just to us as a people but to our to our to our lands and uh <clears throat> to our waters you know to the <clears throat> to the fish, you know, that's, that's what it's all about. And, um, <clears throat> you know, an example for us as chiefs today, we have an honor, honor and a duty to uphold to the, to, you know, to the lands and to the waters and to everything that's there and uh, to our people, you know, and that's what, um, <clears throat> JP was referring to who back then there was our, our, our people were at war. They had no choice. That's what happened to protect our, you know, to like I said, that's to protect what's, they didn't want to see what was, was, what's basically taking place today. You know, so um, to be the governments and industry, they're there for one reason and that's to take all the resource doesn't matter what that resource is. That's that's what it is. That's what it's all about. There's no consequences for for us as a people to if we might be, maybe we're in the way, you know. So there's no regard for the cleanness of water. To another example, I'll give you 2017. Our forests were on fire. 
And that was due to the mismanagement of the way the forces uh, by industry and government. That's what happened. They introduced the pine beetle and the fir beetle and all the trees are dying. You know, so uh, we're, we're the ones that feel those effects. And the same thing with our water. These, these Gibraltar mine, we've been dealing with that company for I don't know how long, 30, 40 years. They want to do the exact same thing out in our headwaters of the Chillicotin River. But um, right now we're, we're saying no. We don't, it doesn't matter if it's uh, billions and trillions of dollars out there where the water, <clears throat> uh, you know, the water quality and uh, it is producing up to a million, million salmon per year for a long time. And uh, the smalls that would go back would be like uh, between 40 to 80 to 100 million smalls that would go back. And that's what we're talking about. Uh, so yeah, that river right now we're the recognized title. We were the only nation that has recognized title and rights. You know, all nations have, have that. But for now, we fought and we, we, we have that for, with all the help from <clears throat> all our allies across BC, across Canada and international, you know, so, and uh, that's why I, re I refer to the Tsekhotin River has been flown title since uh, time immemor immemorial, forever. It's always, you know, those salmon, they're born on tidal lands and that's where our river starts. So we're the only ones that have a say on that, you know, our, uh, us as Selkotian people. And that's how important it is for us to, so we can ha leave something behind there for our children and their children and for a long time. You know, that's, that, that's what those people fought for back, back when for us to maintain that. And that's what we have to do. Another thing, uh, Vancouver, it's the mining capital of the world. All the miners, they're mining here in BC and Canada, but worldwide. And that's what we've been finding out when we, we go international to New York to, to be at the Indigenous Forum. And I, I and uh, Chief Otis, one of my fellow chiefs have been, JP, have been to uh, Geneva, Switzerland. There's another four day, uh, a human rights forum there also. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, th those fish and the animals and the water, they have rights also, you know, not just us as human, human beings, but we have to speak on behalf. So <clears throat> that's very important, you know, with BC and the, uh, federal government uh, talking about UNDRIP. You know, BC's had that in place for about a year now. But if, they, if it's just there, you know, it's not gonna, they're not using it to, to help us. It, it doesn't mean anything. You know, the same with uh, reconciliation. It sounds great. They've been talking about that for how long, but you can't be Holding reconciliation in one hand and a mining permit in the other hand, and say, "Okay, that that doesn't work," you know. So there has to be true, true um, talks, and they have to recognize our our laws. Um, that that the laws flow from title, title and rights. So that that laws have been there ever since we've been our people have been here, you know. So. Somebody mentioned there that they're just starting to get written down, and they're just starting to starting to see us. And once it's written down in our language, and that's when it it actually becomes it becomes uh, our laws again. You know that to deal with everything in our lives. That's that's very important. So yeah, it's um a lot of moving parts, but I'd like to thank everybody that's you know been been a part of this and. Uh, you know, I'm itching to get back to New York and uh, Geneva, Switzerland and places like that to, uh, um, we have to create alliances uh, with everyone that's um, being affected by, you know, um, as a people and you have to have clean water. 
you know, the water or shortages and very important, you know, ceremony and everything that all, that's all part of that. And, you know, so uh, great to uh, Chief Noski and his, his people up there to, you know, they, they've got a head start on this and it's really great to see and everybody that's participating. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Francis. I wanted to um, follow directly on that by linking two questions together. Um, the one question I asked are the, the outward expression of Indigenous laws, is that a more effective way of communi communicating expectations about water management to proponents, to people who are coming onto traditional territories to operate and to the states or the federal and provincial governments? Um, but then linked into the two examples that we have in front of us today. So um, for the Gibraltar mine, the Chilcotin National Government has had to resort to challenging a permit because uh, it hasn't adequately reflected their, their laws. But um, regarding the Andaco, nine, uh, Andaco mine, the Nadley Wooden has achieved sort of a more consensus-based or an ongoing relationship-based management approach. Um, so the question is, what are some of the conditions that need to be present or what are some of the barriers to building those kinds of ongoing lasting relationships to be able to deal with these kinds of impacts and these activities on your territories? And also creating those kinds of structures, those management and governance structures that respect Indigenous law and jurisdiction. Well, first of all, the, the miners, they have to be willing to come to the table you know, in this case, this mining company, they have been at the table, but quite a few times they've walked away, you know, so like with our, um, their proposed mines up in our art part of the, ter you know, our heart of our territory, um, maybe that's why, I don't know, but uh, they have not really been uh, the type to really kind of work with us as, as, as a nation that I, I could see over the years. So yeah, they have to, you know, same with the government, they have to, they have to change. That's, that's the only, only way, you know, they have to change their laws. Their, you know, maybe UNDRIP's gonna help with some of that, uh, um, you know, but they're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna push them you know that's what that's what the international area is all about and canada sits there so when they were asking us for implementation on undrip i said you have to if you you do undrip right you walk into the united nations uh, convention there as a, if you want to be uh, recognized as canada that's working with indigenous people you do that you you make undrip um, so that it's going to work work for us you know, so otherwise, you know, I've been hearing a few things about, oh, they've changed that uh, undrip so many times where it's right down to where it doesn't really, really mean anything. You know, and there's ministers, both levels of government that, that have to implement it. If, if they don't, you know, if they're not, if we're just gonna wait for another 10, 15 years, 20 years, it, no sense. It's not, it's not a document that, you know, it's just gonna make them, you know, uh, they're violating human rights, which that's just what is happening in other countries. And, you know, but we're here and we're going to fight to whatever it takes to protect who we are as a people and our waters and our lands and everything else that goes with it any way we can. You know, if that's going back to war or, uh, well, that's uh, I as a chief, that's my, that's my um, responsibility and I can't can't back down from that you know so that's that's what it's all about and uh, they have to you know not against um, any kind of development but if it's uh, going to damage our environment or our water it's not it, it can come into our, our our nation's territory you know so that's just the bottom line and so that's yeah so that's that's what it's all about and thank you Thank you for the question. Um, one of the things that we, we notice right from the uh, start is when the 
in that of mine that opened in uh, 1964, we found there was a lot of resistance for uh, any involvement of the local First Nations. Uh, we, we fought very hard to get our, our uh, nation recognized during this process. And we've, we've, like I say, we worked very hard to get that uh, ourselves recognized and we did. And now it, it's, it's some of the uh, practices that, that have been in place for many years have, are, are being changed. Uh, one of them is, is um, like I say, closing down of some of the, uh, the water ponds. Uh, there, there was six upwards to six at one point in time. Now I, I think they're they're going to be uh, closing down uh, a few of the the tailings ponds as well. So. There, there is a, a change that's happening. It's, it's slow, but it's, it's, it, it is working. Uh, so we hope to make more changes in the future. And I, I just basically hope everything works out for us. Yuski, I was wondering if you could also speak about the influence of the LNG um, and the negotiations just on how maybe that helped um, with the Indaco mine, if, if you don't mind. Yeah. Well, the, the, the LNG, when, when we first started working with LNG, uh, we, we noticed fairly quickly that that's one of the things that uh, the province really wanted to ensure that it, it, it gets off the ground. and. When we started working with the LNG, it 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 made things easier for us to to um, work um, to, in terms of um, having that 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 this take off. Um, without the LNG, we we wouldn't have uh, done very much in terms of what what we were doing with Indaco mine. So it, 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 it did help uh, quite considerably. And um, so we, we, we just kept, kept at it and kept uh, talking to the province to ensure that any of the changes that's gonna happen is gonna happen because we, we pressured them. Anybody else? I, I could just add, yeah, I think the, the context is always specific to a degree. And, um, and yeah, unfortunately, um, that relationship hasn't been healthy in the case of the Gibraltar mine and SD law. So I, I think that's been, uh, it's a challenge. And, uh, I think that's also why in thinking about organizing this, this event that we really wanted to reflect that for us, um, the work that Chief Larry and his team has done is, is proves that it can be done that um, when, the, when the right spirit is there, um, you know, I, I think uh, proponents can come to the table in a very different way and, and actually find ways to recognize and respect the laws uh, in the territories they're working. So I, I think it's an, it is an important distinction. Um, and that's actually why we were really excited that Nodley was able to join us today. Thank you. I'm just noticing our time and we're unfortunately coming to the end of our time together. But what I wanted to do is just point you to a couple of questions about cumulative impact. So we have you know, in addition, um, so many, many impacts on the Fraser River, in addition to the Andaco mine, 
to the Gibraltar mine. There's also the uh, ongoing uh, impact from the Mount Polly mine, so discharging into Quinault Lake and then ultimately the Fraser River. So cumulatively, this is all coming uh, into the Fraser River and having an impact on salmon and an impact on communities. So what are your thoughts on, what I'd like to do is just ask a general question and invite you to um, either respond to the question or not, but also give us your concluding comments. So uh, if everyone could have one more chance to speak and give us your concluding comments, and then we'll end with Chief, Chief Lassie in um, to do the closing for us. So what are your thoughts on cumulative impacts? Uh, these are permits and discharges from different mines in different places, ultimately all ending up in the Fraser River, along with other impacts from pulp mills and from other uh, industrial operations. And uh, what are your thoughts in terms of moving forward in a context of the alignment of BC laws with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and um, the free prior and informed consent standard that that requires of the provincial government? Yeah, this is uh, Councillor Howard Johnny. Um, like uh, Estella First Nation has aim been impacted quite a lot by mining and other industries, especially with all the uh, discharges allowed into the Fraser River. And then all this dilution there is, it all still goes somewhere down into our, all down through the tribut tributaries all the way into the ocean. And it's slowly adding up and people are not seeing this, even they're saying it's diluted, it's really not. It's just being pushed down river and that's the stuff we wanted to see is in like right now, Gibraltar Mines asking for an increase in discharge and that's what we don't want is more dumping into the freezer to dilute all these stuff that are not good for the fish and anything that is in our waterways. And like say our nation has been impacted like IR12, like in my past, we used the hay and everything in there and we used to have a creek there with um, large trout now there is no more trout there. There is no more creek that is in that IR-12. So it's been pretty well abandoned because we used to have horses and everything. We used to hay with the drink from that creeks and that and now people are afraid to use the water in that area. So that is a quite an impact to the state of First Nation. It's kind of like a loss of use of a land because we can't hay anymore and we can't bring our animals over there. And, and also, yeah, like like you mentioned, Mount Polly that had a quite the whole tailings pond up into the Quinal Lakes. And now I'm hearing here, you can only eat so much of the fish because a lot of it's been infected and a lot of those metals and whatever sunk to the bottom of that river. And that river comes down into the Fraser and infects all the communities all right through us all the way downstream. So I think there is quite a bit of impact to all First Nations that are in that area and are downstream. And that's why we put our law in the place to prevent all this more discharge going in. And hopefully all industry will respect our laws that have been put in place. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you once again. Uh, there was, um, I forget what year it was, but there was a Fraser River Declaration uh, um, that was made by all the nations up and down along the Fraser River. So those are some of the uh, items that have to be stood back up and, uh, you know, they're, they're all affected um, similar to us, you know, so... Uh, you know, every mine, uh, there has to be more stricter regulation and all that. And even just to apply for a permit, you know, that's stuff like that, that's all outdated, you know, so that's really have to be looked at in all different areas. And uh, so uh, just like Howard saying, that's a, it's a threat to us, you know, all these mines and everything else, that's a, it's a threat to our livelihood, our food and our traditional food and we don't have access to traditional food or health statistics starts going all over the place and that's that's why i say that genocide's still here 
you know, so still our people are still dying, and that's not a, a, that's not acceptable. So there has to be drastic uh, changes made by the government and industry, and you know, if they want to be in our territory at all. So, thank you. AP, did you want to just have a concluding comment before we uh, turn to Chief Mitsky and Dr. Freed? Sure. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for this opportunity. Appreciate it. Um, and yeah, I think there's there's a lot of work to do. And um, I really, I hope that dealing with issues like the Gibraltar discharge, it's actually a place, it's a place to start on some of these issues um, and just really needs the kind of the critical mass. And, and so this is a good opportunity to share and learn about it. And uh, yeah, I'm grateful that so many people wanted to learn. So thank you and I look forward to the next opportunity. Thank you. And JP, if you, I haven't been monitoring the chat, but if you're able to put any link, uh, links to URLs either to watch the final submissions on May 20th and 21st, and specifically to the TNG uh, website where people can uh, get information for more action. That would be fantastic. Thank you. I, All right, final a, word. Sorry, there is in the Q&A answers, the link to the Environmental Appeal Board live stream was, I did answer that. And I will put a link to TNG's website where there's more information. Thank you. Uh, Chief Nuski and Dr. Freed. Thank you. Um, that's a pretty wide open question in terms of uh, cumulative impacts. Um, where do you start? Uh, do you start in when the first white person came to Canada? Uh, it, it's quite an interesting uh, question. Um, in 2018, uh, not lay with and suffered uh, the 20 uh, the wildfire. Um, we we thought it's never going to end because the cumulative impact there is the the wildfires. Um, you look at the rivers and streams that 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 because of the overfishing that that was done in the past, as well as uh, Alcan completion project, uh, that's an impact as well. Um, so there, there are so many uh, impacts that we suffered as uh, First Nations people uh, uh, up uh, um, along the, the Fraser River, uh, Nechaco River. Um, uh, so it, it's, for me, it's hard to put a, a start date and end date. Uh, it's, there's been so many impacts. I, I don't even know where the heck to start. Thank you, Chief Nuski. I, um, my, my message would be that I, I see a lot of inconsistencies across the province with uh, mine regulations. And um, I just want people to um, think carefully about their assumptions because um, I, I think we all at some level think, oh, it's being taken care of. But um, in my experience, uh, really First Nations are taking care of um, mining projects. And uh, that comes from like a lot of years in working in this field. So I do think we need some stronger regulations and uh, we need to stand up for what's right. And we need to shed more light on these issues. I think the more light we shed on these issues and the more we understand them, um, the, the better things will, will become. And, and I think we need to be fully engaged and um, be very careful with the opportunities for regulatory engagement. Um, they can be windows of opportunities and they, they can only exist sometimes for a short amount of time. And we need to make sure we're prepared and uh, ready to be fully engaged. Thank you. All right, I'd, I'd like to say, say a big thank you on behalf of all the participants to the panelists. Thank you so much for sharing your deep wealth of experience, for bringing the very specific examples to us uh, to help us to better understand this uh, problem of mining and mine regulation in British Columbia. 
And uh, just to point specifically to the current appeal that the Chilcotin National Government has right now uh, in that conversation in a very formalistic setting with the provincial government about what should go into the water uh, in the Fraser River and who is authority to be able to take care of the river. I'd like to turn it over to Chief Lassis to do a final prayer so that we can end in a good way. Thank you. Uh, we thank uh, Creator for giving us another day. Uh, also, I pray for all the uh, people, uh, including ours, that are being impacted by this pandemic. Uh, you know, especially the families that have uh, been impacted, uh, might have lost loved ones. Uh, prayers go out to all those families and uh, I pray that uh, that will uh, be heard by uh, by whoever it is uh, uh, the First Nations and uh, that will continue to survive uh, in a good way and uh, also for the all species of fish and you know that they'd have uh, clean waters and uh, that they won't go extinct and uh, that we'll have plenty of food, uh, traditional food for for all of us uh, and uh, continue, you know, for the alliance uh, that we've created uh, over the years and uh, that we'll be able to uh, work together and uh, have a, a good future for the ones that are, they're not here yet and uh, we ask all this in a good way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Francis. And thank you to all the participants. Please do consider uh, digging in a little bit more to these issues. Uh, have a look at the BC Mining Law Reform uh, website and also uh, to supporting the Chilcotin National Government in their appeal. Thanks very much to the organizers in particular to the folks behind the scenes, so to Nikki Skoos and to uh, Mining Watch Canada and to Holly Patterson at the Environmental Law Center. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye.